Thank you. Yeah. We do have a question and answer box as well as the chat box. Um, if you do have questions while you're uh, the, for our panelists today, um, I invite you to put those questions in the Q&A box. Um, you'll find that at the bottom of your screen. Um, and when, uh, we'll, we'll go through those questions and answers together. You might wanna use the chat box uh, for interacting with our attendees here um, and sharing information um, responding to, uh, to what you're hearing. Um, but again, please reserve the Q&A um, text or your questions for the Q&A so that we can make sure we get to them. So just a little bit about who your hosts are today. For those of you who are not members of the National Safer Supply Community Practice, uh, my name is Rebecca Penn and I'm the project manager. I should have started with that. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, just uh, to let you know a little bit about us, um, we're funded by Health Canada Substance Use and Addiction Program. We're a collaboration between London Intercommunity Health, Health Centre, um, the Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs, and the Alliance for Healthier Communities. And our mandate is to support the scale up of safer supply programs across Canada. Our focus uh, at this point in time is on a medical model of safer supply. And that's due to the current legislative and regulatory context that we're operating in. Um, however, we also um, give space to uh, work on an advocacy for non-medical models, recognizing their important role in the continuum of, uh, of needs for people who use drugs, meeting the, the needs of people who use drugs, and recognizing that that is what people who use drugs are asking for. Um, there, our community practice has working groups happening, knowledge exchange events like this one, um, and uh, we also are developing some tools uh, that's coming from our working groups and such. Uh, if you're not currently a member of the community practice, I invite you to join us. You can go to our website. Um, and uh, at our website, you'll find uh, uh, all of our past webinars and such, our resource library and information about how to join and all of our other activities. We have a certificate of attendance that's available to you today. Um, you just follow, we'll pop a link in the chat about halfway through. Uh, click on that link, it'll take you to a form, fill that form out, and boom, you'll get a certificate of attendance in your inbox, in your email. And yes, as I said, uh, you might want to check out our website so you can learn more about um, the resources that we have. We have some FAQs on safer supply uh, and some resources for um, healthcare providers that you might find useful there. So check out our website. Uh, and you can go there to, to join our community of practice as well. Okay, with that, I'm really excited to turn this over to our panelists today. Um, I'm not going to introduce them. I'm gonna let them introduce themselves and um, we will, uh, I'm very confident we're gonna have an amazing discussion. Uh, Tara, Andrea, Jillian, thank you so much for being here today to, uh, to start us off with this, this webinar series and talking about this important new paper that you've just published. I turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Rebecca. I appreciate that. Um, so my name is Jillian Kola. I am a postdoctoral fellow at the Canadian Institute for Substance Use Research at the University of Victoria. Um, Tara Gomes is here with me as well. She is a scientist at Unity Health Toronto, and we will be joined shortly by Ashley Smoke, who's with the Ontario Network of People Who Use Drugs and the Women in HIV AIDS Initiative. Um, we're very happy to be here today to speak a little bit more in detail about the data from a paper that was published um, two weeks ago in the Canadian Medical Association Journal on clinical outcomes and healthcare costs among people entering a safer supply program in Ontario. And um, just before we get started, I would like to humbly acknowledge that I'm an uninvited, an uninvited settler um, on the lands and territories of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Especially following the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation this past Friday, I also want to acknowledge that the drug toxicity overdose crisis in Canada has disproportionately impacted First Nations, Indigenous, Métis people across the country as a result of both historical as well as current and continuing impacts of colonization. 
We rightly spent time last week acknowledging the deep harms from residential schools on Indigenous children, families, and communities, and the intergenerational trauma that resulted. I want to also acknowledge the ways in which, starting with the 60s scoop and continuing today, child welfare and youth protection agencies continue to be deployed against First Nations, Indigenous, Indigenous Métis, and Inuit families across the country. Canadian drug policy has deeply racist roots. This includes not just policies focused on the criminalization of drug use and people who use drugs, but also the policies within child welfare agencies that disproportionately impact Indigenous children and families, which continues today and must be urgently addressed. I'd also like to take a moment to honor and acknowledge the memories of all of the community members, friends and families of ours who we've lost to the overdose and drug policy crisis that we're currently facing in North America. And um, on that note, it doesn't need to be emphasized to this group um, that we're in the midst of an absolutely devastating um, crisis of overdose related deaths. Um, this is some of the data from Ontario, um, where in just the last five years, we've had close to 10,000 people who've died due to opioid related toxicity. Um, 2021 was the worst year to date for opioid related deaths in Ontario with 2,819 people who died. And I think that it's always important when we're talking about the current overdose and drug toxicity crisis that we're facing to acknowledge that 90% of those deaths were due to fentanyl. Um, and so when we're talking about the crisis that we're trying to address right now um, in Ontario, but across the country, um, we really need to focus on the fact that it is an unregulated drug supply that has been permeated and supplanted with fentanyl over the last six or seven years that is responsible for this massive uptick in deaths that we've seen and the continuing crisis that we're facing today. So there's been several interventions um, that have been proposed in order to try to deal with and address the overdose crisis that we're facing right now. One of them, and the one that we're going to be presenting data to you on today, um, is around safer opioid supply programs. Um, now, safer supply programs, again, I probably don't need to define this for most of the audience here, um, involve the prescription of pharmaceutical opioids, usually a take-home dose of pharmaceutical opioids, to people who are using street-acquired unregulated fentanyl. Um, so in most cases, and again, there's fairly wide variation across the country, um, there's a numerous different program models that have developed. So just to give you a bit more information about the program model specifically that we'll be talking about today is one where medication is prescribed by a physician or a nurse practitioner, and then dispensed daily at a pharmacy. Um, people can go and pick up the medications at the pharmacy of their choice. Um, in most cases, this involves the prescription for a short acting high uh, opioid, um, most of the time hydromorphone that's available as a take home dose for unsupervised use. People can either take this orally or they can inject it, um, as well as a long acting opioid, um, most commonly slow release oral morphine that's frequently taken um, under supervision at the pharmacy um, once daily. And the goal of these programs is very, very much focused on reducing the overdose risk that's associated with using unregulated fentanyl of very varying doses and concentrations from the street supply by giving people instead a known dose of pharmaceutical opioids. Um, these programs are very, very clearly implanted within a harm reduction philosophy, um, and we'll speak a little bit more about that as we go through. The program that we're going to speak about today is a program that was started at London Intercommunity Health Centre in 2016 by Dr. Andrea Sereda, who's joined us as well, um, and will be available to answer any questions on the clinical sides of the program, if there's any at the end of the presentation. Um, this program started off very slowly with just a small number of people who were experiencing very significant health consequences from their drug use um, when they were initiated into the program. Um, and then the program received funding in March of of 2020 from the Substance Use and Addictions Program at Health Canada, which allowed for an expansion of um, social support and wraparound services for people who were in the Safer Supply Program. This model is very much implanted in primary care. So people are receiving primary care at the community health center. Um, they become members of the primary team, um, they become clients of the primary care team there, um, and they have access to wraparound services. Now, prior to March of 2020, um, 
Um, they had access to comprehensive medical care, including primary pre preventative care, treatment of HIV, Hep C, and more limited wraparound services because this wasn't yet funded. After the SUAP funding, um, there is quite a full spectrum of care involved for people, including outreach workers, care facilitators, system navigators, nurses, and nurse practitioners. Now, just really quickly before we present to you some of the results on our from our study, I think it's important to emphasize the fact that we are at a point right now where there is a very a much stronger and emerging evidence base on safer supply. There has been quite a number of publications that have occurred um, this year and last year um, that have really expanded the evidence base so far on safer supply. Um, for example, we published, um, I was a member of a team that published um, a paper last year that looked at the uptake of safer supply prescribing between January of 2016 and March of 2020, which found around 450 people who had been initiated onto Safer Supply in Ontario in that period. There's also a very interesting paper um, that came out earlier this year with the amazing title of COVID just kind of opened a can of whoop ass, um, which actually looked at the expansion of Safer Supply programs prior to the onset of the COVID pandemic in March of 2020, um, but then actually did another really, really quick look um, in May of 2020 to see what had happened in those initial few months of the COVID pandemic and found actually a 258% increase in sites offering safer supply um, between March 1st and May 1st. So really there was actually this really quick uptake of safer supply prescribing in the early days of the COVID pandemic across the country. And um, this paper has some really interesting findings around implementation as well that I would invite you to, um, to take a look at. Um, We've also done some work. Um, I was separate from the study we're talking about today. I also led an evaluation of some of, uh, of the uh, London Safer Supply Program. And we found very high retention rates for this program accompanied by reductions in fentanyl use, improvements in health status. Um, patients were reporting very, um, high, uh, uh, very large reductions in overdose, reductions in involvement in criminal activities, as well as reductions in emergency department visits and hospitalization that we see echoed in the data that we're going to present to you today. So this type of evaluation um, is finding is uh, uh, evaluation is ongoing in several safer supply programs across the country, and I think that we're going to see actually a very, very large amount of evidence come out. Um, there's another paper that came out earlier this year that was looking at the initial days of prescribing safer supply um, in British Columbia as well, and they found very similar findings to what we found in the London evaluation um, in terms of high volatility um, in the unregulated drug market, particularly in the early pandemic period, people receiving risk mitigation prescriptions or safer supply that was um, very, very tied to the COVID pandemic um, in those early days reported a reduction in cravings and less withdrawal due to accessing pharmaceutical safe supply more stability in their lives, in their drug use, as well as reduced overdose risk. So this is very much echoing what we found in London as well. Um, some of the issues that were reported there were that the low doses being prescribed didn't necessarily meet people's needs, and a very, very large need for a variety of drugs that corresponds to what people were using from the street market, which also was a finding in our London evaluation. So we're seeing some real moments of um, uh, there's some real correspondence that's happening between some of the research that's happening, um, pinpointing some of the issues that we're seeing in safer supply programs, as well as highlighting some of the ways forward to improve the experience for people who are accessing these programs. And at this point, I'm going to turn you over to Tara, who is going to start talking about our study specifically. Thanks, Jillian. And hi, everyone. Nice to uh, be here. And thank you for the invitation to present uh, some of this work with the panel. Um, so as Jillian mentioned, uh, really we designed this study to be an opportunity for us to use some of the regular collective health care that exists in Ontario at an organization called ICES and link that with client data from the London Safer Opioid Supply Program so that we could do a quantitative evaluation um, looking at a variety of different outcomes related to health services use and clinical outcomes in this population. And for those of you who aren't familiar with ICES, this is my poor attempt at graphically just displaying uh, what it all does, which is essentially every time somebody has a contact within the healthcare system in Ontario, be it you know getting a prescription dispensed at a pharmacy, seeing a doctor, going to a merge or a hospital, um, their data is is captured um, for administrative purposes and tied to their health card number, and that is anonymized and linked together, which we can then use for research purposes. And we also um, have a relationship with the coroner's office in Ontario, which allows us to capture 
all um, opioid related deaths based on um, coroner's investigations and postmortem toxicology that allows us to have a very um, rigorous way of capturing opioid toxicity deaths that occur in the province as well. So essentially what we did using this data was create two groups of people or cohorts. The first being clients of the London Safer Supply Program um, who were able to be linked to our data. There were 82 clients between uh, the dates of January 2016 and March 2019 who are part of that program who we included in this study. And just to tie in with what Jillian said earlier, this was a time during which the program did not have the full SUAP funding. And so there were the limited wraparound services that were provided, but these were people who were part of a primary care um, program and who were receiving safe opioid supply through that program. And what we then did was match them to uh, what we call the comparator cohort. And these were people who also lived in London because we wanted to make sure they had a similar um, uh, underlying unregulated drug supply that people would be accessing. And we made sure that uh, matched individuals also had a diagnosis of opioid use disorder and were similar on a variety of demographic and clinical characteristics, but were not clients of the London Safer Supply Program. So essentially people who could theoretically have been part of the program, but were not part of the program and were similar on a variety of factors. And the goal here being we wanted to see whether or not there were changes in outcomes among this London Safer Supply clients and that were not seen within the comparator group to provide some level of specificity to the findings. We looked at a number of different outcomes. Our main outcomes that we looked at were related to health services utilization. So rates of emergency department visits, hospital admissions, and admissions for infections, because that is one of the things that has come up in the past um, when people have uh, had questions about safer supply was whether there might be an increased risk of infection. So we very purposefully included this as a primary outcome so that we could look at whether there was any signal um, around infections among people who are part of the, this program. And then we looked at uh, total healthcare costs. Now those healthcare costs, just as a caveat, could not include primary care costs. Um, or medication costs, because those costs are not captured for the entire population, but these are largely costs related to engagements um, in hospital systems, um, as well as, you know, lab-related costs, those kinds of things. And, uh, and then we also describe the populations for a variety of clinical characteristics, such as HIV, hepatitis C, and, and prior hospitalizations for serious infections, because we know that um, you know, prior, prior infections can be predictive of future um, infectious complications as well. We took two approaches to analyzing these data. The first was what is called an interrupted time series analysis. And this is basically trying to look for a change in trends. So we can look at monthly rates of outcomes in each of our populations. And then we want to see at the time of entering the Safer Supply Program, whether there is a, a change in that trend line that we were seeing prior to entering the program. And so that was our, our first analysis. But then we also did more of a classic pre-post analysis where we looked at the rate of outcomes among everybody in our cohorts in the year prior to entering the program and in the year following um, entering the program to see if there were significant differences in those annual comparisons as well. So um, we just think about who was included in this study. This is a, a excerpt from our main demographic table um, describing those who are in the safer supply uh, cohort and then the matched individuals who were not exposed to safer supply of which there were 303 people. We matched on age, sex, eligibility for public drug benefits and prior ED visits or hospitalizations for opioid toxicity. So you will see um, that those numbers are essentially perfectly balanced between the two groups. So we had very obviously high similarity. Um, on average, people were about 41 years of age about 40% of people were male, um, and about 8% of people had a prior opioid toxicity in the last year. Um, there were, though, some uh, continued differences between the groups even after doing this matching. Um, in particular, you'll notice that there was a much higher prevalence of HIV and hepatitis C, as well as a higher prevalence of hospitalizations for infections before entering the program. Uh, there are many reasons for this, um, largely related to the population that was initially uh, a focus of recruitment for the Safer Supply Program. And I think what this does is show that the, the clients who were part of this program, especially in the window that we used, were quite complex, often had a number of different comorbidities, 
um, very often had HIV and or hepatitis C as well as histories of infections. So this is a complex population at very high risk of overdose as well as very high clinical need generally. This is the, an example of the analysis. So this is the figure that shows the rates of emergency department visits, one of our primary outcomes. The green line is the line that represents the rate among the safer supply clients and the dotted gray line represents our comparator population. So those who are not part of a safer supply program. And that red vertical line is essentially the timing of entering the program. And for the unexposed, it's essentially a, a we assign a dummy index state that equals their matched counterpart. So everybody has a time zero. And what you can see is that especially in the couple of years before entering the safer supply program in the in this in the London clients, that green line, the rate of ED visits was climbing and was consistently higher than what we saw in the comparator group. So this was again this population that was really a pretty high user of. Um, healthcare services, and in this case, emergency department visits. But what we found was that immediately after becoming um, part of this program, there was a significant decline in the rate of ED visits among SOS clients, and that equated to about 14 fewer visits per 100 individuals every month. And that was a very rapid and immediate decline that we saw. And we didn't see any sort of reduction for the unexposed in, uh, individuals. So that gray line really didn't change in height and it stayed really consistent across the board, which really just shows that um, that specificity to this being an effect that we saw among safer supply clients and not in the matched comparative group. We replicated that essentially for our other outcomes, and you can see that for inpatient hospital admissions, there was again a significant decline of about five admissions per 100 individuals. Um, that happened immediately after entering the program, and healthcare costs also declined by nearly $1,000 a person, and that, again, was a significant and very rapid decline in, in healthcare costs, um, largely associated with ED visits and hospitalizations for these individuals. We looked, as I mentioned, at incident infections and saw no change in infections, so there was uh, no sign of any sort of increase in incident infections in this analysis. And then when we looked at the unexposed individuals, there was really no change across any of these outcomes. So any changes we observed here were very specific to those who are in the safer supply program. As I mentioned, we also did this analysis comparing rates in the year before versus the year after being part of the program. Just to orient you to these um, tables, the first three columns represent uh, the changes in safer supply clients. And then the, the columns on the right represent uh, the changes or lack thereof among unexposed individuals. And this is just uh, to kind of reiterate some of the consistency with the other analysis and that we again saw significant declines in rates of ED visits and hospital admissions among people who were part of the Safer Supply Program. In this analysis, we also saw that when we looked at total number of hospital admissions for incident infections, there was also a significant decline in the one year following entry, entry into the program compared to the one year before among Safer Supply clients. So, you know, in contrast to um, concerns about incident infections going up, we actually saw a significant decline in that rate in the year um, following participation in the Safer Supply Program. And when we look at the matched unexposed individuals, there were no changes in any of those outcomes. We also looked at a number of secondary outcomes, so mental health-related hospitalizations and ED visits, opioid-related hospitalizations, um, substance use disorder-related ED visits and hospitalizations, and none of those changed significantly uh, among safer supply clients. We did see some changes in the matched unexposed individuals in a couple of these outcomes, most notably the mental health related ED visits and hospitalizations. And when we looked uh, a little bit more closely at that, oh, if you can just go back one slide, Jillian. Uh, when we looked a little more closely at that, uh, we saw that there was one individual who had a very high number of mental health related hospitalizations in that year prior. And so they were really driving that reduction. It was one individual out of those 300. Um, and, and so it was not you know, a, a consistent shift among all of the unexposed individuals there. What was also just something to note is that the rate of, um, of death in both populations was very low and there were no opioid related deaths among safer supply clients as well. And then if we look at costs, which was one of the last elements that we looked at, we did see that the healthcare related costs did decline significantly. So similar to our time series analysis, when we compared the year prior to the year after participation in the program, 
Um, there were significant de declines in healthcare related costs among safer supply clients that were not observed in the unexposed individuals. When we look at the medication related costs, we did see increases. And this isn't unexpected. So obviously the cost of hydromorphone and OAT could lead to some increases in costs for medications, although those were not actually the drivers. So they only represented about 15% of total medication costs um, within safer supply clients. What we um, anticipate really here is that as a, I mentioned earlier, there was a very high prevalence of HIV and hepatitis C in this population. And what of um, the one of the objectives of the program is also to ha help people get connected to treatment um, for HIV and hep hepatitis C. And those treatments, those medications are very expensive. And so this increase in costs from, from non-hydromorphone, non-OAT related medications is likely indicative of the access to care and treatment for HIV and hepatitis C that people were accessing on part of the program as well. And while those are costly, a lot of those costs are also short-term, especially for hepatitis C, where people will get treated, and then that, that has a long-term savings for the healthcare system, because um, for most people, their hepatitis C will be cured, and they will not have the not only the decreases in quality of life and, and downstream healthcare complications, but also, obviously, there are healthcare savings that are associated with that as well. So I think at this point, I will pass it back to Jillian. Perfect. Thank you, Tara. Um, so just really quickly, I want to speak to some of the limitations of um, the data that we presented to you today. Um, so one of the main limitations is, is that this is just um, data from one program in Ontario, um, which means that it has a relatively small sample size, and we want to be cautious about the generalizability of the data. Um, I think that right now, as I mentioned earlier, we're at a point where we're going to start getting a lot of data from a lot of different sources, including larger population cohorts in Ontario, as well as in British Columbia. Um, which will really help to expand the evidence base um, and hopefully build off of some of the findings that we presented to you today. There's also a danger of unmeasured confounding um, within um, the um, within the um, the analyses that we used. Um, however, the fact that we were using a pre post analysis design with safer supply clients um, to assess the impacts of the program on outcome rates um, that we then use the unexposed control group to serve as a form of test of specificity. And so the fact that we saw a very strong trend among safer supply clients that wasn't there for um, the unexposed controls um, gives us confidence in the findings that we're presenting today. Um, I just want to highlight as well that overdose rates here um, are likely an underestimate as they are only overdoses that were treated in hospital, either in the emergency department or who were, that were hospitalized. And as we all know, many overdoses are treated in the community without being um, hospitalized. And so those were not captured. Um, also, so um, we just highlight again um, that um, we're unable to access the cost of primary care that's provided through community health centers um, because that is in a, a different basket of services um, and it's not available through the OHIP database. Um, and so that means that um, we're unable to estimate the changing costs of primary care among safer supply clients. We would imagine that this would have gone up and that people would have actually had more costs to do with primary care. However, given that this is a population that frequently has really poor access to primary care services, and we know the value of primary care in terms of its preventative nature, um, this overall actually could be seen as a form of a positive um, that people have better access to primary care and that we're spending more money on that. I just also want to note that we're unable to measure any form of diversion involved um, in, um, in this study. Um, this is partly because any kind of um, data on sharing or selling of medications that people might have gotten from a safer supply program obviously doesn't get entered into the OHIP data database. Um, but really, we were focused here on the health outcomes and the costs. Um, and that was really where our main outcomes were and lie. Um, so in conclusion, um, just to sum up some of the results of our study among people who were receiving safer supply clients of the safer supply program, um, there was a significant decline in emergency department visits, inpatient hospitalizations, hospitalization for incident infections, and total non primary care health care costs. Um, and we didn't find a change among the matched unexposed cohort. Um, among safer supply clients, there was no increase in incident infections, opioid related 
related deaths or all cause mortality, um, which um, provides some reassuring initial data on the health outcomes and the safety and effectiveness of safer supply programs. These are some of the major things that people were concerned about. And not only did we not find any form of concerning signals, we found very positive impacts on people who are receiving safer supply program, uh, safer supply, especially compared to the unexposed cohort. Um, so um, thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to turn it over to Ashley um, Smoke now, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the implications and community response um, to our data. And we're going to be very, very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Um, so if you want to put those into the Q&A, we will um, move to that um, after Ashley. Over to you, Ashley. Hi, so I'm going to be talking a bit about the implications and what um, the community can do to respond to the issues at hand. Um, so like in the last, I don't know, since January 2016, 29,000 people have died of overdoses. And there are many more drug related deaths, if you count other deaths that deal with like infections and other kinds of things that that people who use drugs face. Um, the contamination of fentanyl and analogs have impacted people who use drugs in many negative ways and preventable ways to the point that people who are seasoned opiate users, um, we black out or like don't remember things. And it's created this paradigm where um, harm reduction tools and methods that were once used are becoming um, kind of useless at times, and people who use drugs are suffering. People are dying of rising infections, getting, um, and it's getting worse. Tolerances are getting too high to give people proper health care. And I think some of these things are really important to highlight when we're talking about costs associated with the healthcare system. Um, and I think also, it's interesting because we, we spend so much time gathering data about people who use drugs, and um, quite often the the output for people who use drugs is not quite what we want, and it feels at times like our culture has been stolen from us and utilized to create these programs that kind of like take our culture and then medicalize it. So I just wanted to address some of that before going into some of the other things. Um, also, people who use drugs are dying at increasing rates um, and the services are not coming anywhere near meeting the needs of that, that we have. Um, and there's such inequitable access to services, especially SOS. And it's creating this feeling of like oppression and it's it causes people who use drugs to have mental health issues, in fact, because like when I go to my safer supply program and I go to the counter sometimes, but not always, there's like this thing saying that pe there, there's like this thing, um, like a poster or whatever, saying that they're looking for people to join the SOS program. So people will call the number and then so many will people people will call the number that now they're not taking anymore. They're not taking any more intakes. And then people get so discouraged by going through all these programming programs and trying to do all these different intakes and then getting rejected. And it's just this complete like runaround that that really affects people's well-being and eventually like their health outcomes. So like I said, we research people who use drugs to a great degree, but we rarely see benefits. Um, and the people who pay the ultimate consequences are those that are dying. And it's because of the inaction and indifference of a lot of the systems and structures that are in place. When governments declare expansion of SOS services, that, that also contributes to the mental health of people who use drugs and the negative, like the decline of it, because seeing all these things in the news about how, how you, you're going to be able to access these new services and access these new medications, and then to actually go try to do that and see that what you see in the media is not really as accurate or isn't realistic is kind of disheartening and it makes people think that nobody really cares about them and it's 
it just feels like these waiting lists and these these services are just impenetrable and it can really it can really discourage people from trying to get treatment um in whatever form they deem as treatment um this study was done in an area where there's like robust services so i just wanted to note that it also may not be indicative of like the the areas that are maybe like rural or more remote or very conservative um and people who use drugs in those kinds of areas are at a lot more risk and have a lot less safety and confidentiality. So I think those are really important lessons that um, may not have been noted in this research. Um, also, the current model of SOS is not meeting the needs of people who use drugs in terms of the medicine. Like it, it does, but a lot of people went on safe supply so that they could like get off of fentanyl, but still feel euphoria and still have that feeling of the drug. But in because fentanyl and all the analogs are so strong and potent, people's tolerances are so high that the medications we offer on Safer Supply are not meeting the, the goals that patients have. And I think that those kinds of things need to be addressed as well. Um, also, there's been a push towards oat in some safer opioid supply programs. Um, and that has that has caused like medication switches for a lot of patients that didn't intend to switch and may have caused negative issues in their lives. Um, I'm one of them and I know a few others. But the wraparound care model increases the quality of life for those on the program. So I think like that definitely outweighs the other part because like you can eventually get your tolerance down and then being able to get to that point where like the wraparound care, you're able to actually take advantage of it is really meaningful for people who use drugs once they can get to that point where they can access these and they they're meaningful for them um it's it's often hard to get seen for anything besides your dose on methadone so like on safer supply there's in some programs there's like mental health psychiatry um physiotherapy um social workers like other services to increase people's well-being security um quality of life and it's it's not just about the health care, but more about like helping address all the social determinants of health um, while treating the opioid use. And that's what's more more effective, I think, for a lot of people is doing it all at once rather than like having to deal with your opioid use in order to get mental health treatment. I think I've noticed in the community that folks who have been able to deal with their mental health at the same time or be even before were more just had better like sense of well-being and had better just overall feelings of wellness in my experience um and this sort of holistic approach also saves tax dollars and will save lives as well so i think it's important um, to keep people in care and retained in treatment. And to do that, we have to think of more um, creative and thoughtful ways to give service and care. Um, the study showed that SOS, even in our current context, with some of those issues I explained, reduced ER visits and hospital admi admissions, infection admissions, health care and medication costs, which is such a benefit to pe people who use drugs because our medication costs are quite expensive, and <laughs> especially when you get them from the street. Um, and also the stigma associated with going to the to the places where um, you would seek health care, like ER departments and other places like that, like when you have to call the ambulance, it's very stigmatizing and can leave like more trauma and create a more negative experience. So if more programs offered more basic wraparound social and healthcare services, people would 
could go to SOS doctors instead of going to ERs and calling ambulances and costing the system more money. Um, and also they have better relationships with their practitioners. And I find that people who use drugs go where they feel comfortable. And if they're comfortable with their doctor, they're going to go to their doctor for some of those things that they would prior to having an SOS doctor probably go to like an ambulance or an ER for. Um, the reductions of cravings is a great thing because like having reduced cravings allows you to live your life and kind of achieve some of your goals. And then that empowers you to do all the things that you want to do with your life, whatever that is. Um, and the fact that there was no opioid related deaths among SOS clients in the year after means that the goal of saving lives, um, is being achieved, which is like a great thing and it's the goal of safer supply. So I think we're heading in the right direction. Um, another barrier, however, is women with children. Um, women who access safer opioid supply are oftentimes not forthright and not able to necessarily be so honest with their doctors. So they may not want to come to, to a safer opioid supply program if they fear disclosing drug use will have child welfare involvement. So I think it's important to kind of um, acknowledge those barriers and kind of adjust your program accordingly and to for the so that the women have the most output uh, or outcomes I the best outcomes I think that's important so I think working with child welfare systems and the women who have children is should be a big um, piece of programming for safer opioid supply also thinking like also the thinking and structure of our society where stigma and discrimination are such a big thing. I think we need to address those issues, but it's kind of really hard because those are systemic issues. But I think just being like advocating for the elimination of stigma and discrimination and making policies and procedures very streamlined so that um, people can't, you know, discriminate and stigmatize people who use drugs. I think that's important. Um, one implication I noticed was infection rates. So I think I've noticed a rise in infections for whatever reason. I'm not sure if it's the safer supply medications, if it's people using fentanyl, if it's the stuff in the fentanyl. I don't really know, but th there's a lot of infections both with people on safer opioid supply and not. So I'm... I, I, I just, it's just like an interesting thing for me as someone who uses drugs. I don't understand it, but I want to. Um, and I think by increasing people's access to other healthcare streams, other than like hospitals and emergency services, um, I think that's an important aspect of health, of healthcare for people who use drugs. Um, also, being able to address people's homelessness and people's housing needs and safety needs, hygiene needs, other things like that might help with infections. I know like if you're homeless or like in an abusive relationship, you might like want to inject really fast or want to get it in really quick so no one sees you or so you don't get in trouble or for whatever reason and I think be some of those safety issues create um unsafe injection practices which could lead to infections so I think it's important to acknowledge that um but infections going up and ER visits going down is something I also read so I think that part is interesting to me and it shows the value of having a safer opioid supply program and the value of having that doctor patient relationship that's really meaningful and honest. I think that is like one of the biggest keys to um people who to people who use drugs treatment. 
But in terms of like community responses, I think that people who use drugs have been leading the responses for so long. And I think we're often not given leadership positions. We're often not given like management positions or it, like we're often not given a say very much in the way services and systems are run. And I think in order for the response to be effective, that's what needs to happen. People who use drugs need to be leading the responses. We need to be um, we need to be educating everyone on what is valuable to us and what our culture is like so that it doesn't just keep being taken and medicalized. I think we need to advocate for people who use drugs to, to be the ones to be doing this research and doing things like, I don't know, all these different presentations and whatnot. Sorry, guys. <laughs> But I just, I feel like people who use drugs have been on the sidelines far too long and it's time for us to take some of that back and to get some more leadership and involvement in different programs and services that affect us. So I think like that is the main message and I think that's gonna be how we save the most lives and end overdoses, so yeah. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, those were some really, really important reflections, I think, for all of us, um, both on the current state of Safer Supply, as well as some of the pathways forward. I very much appreciate it. Um, so we're going to now, um, I just wanted to make sure that you have all of our contact information um, before we wrap up. Um, and um, we're going to move into the question and answer period, I think. Um, I can see that there's already some great questions that have been put in the Q&A. Please feel free to um, add some other ones in there if you would like. Um, and um, yeah, Tara, I think that you were going to grab the, the first question, which seems like it's about some of the, um, the cost per person. Sorry, Jillian and Tara, one second. Sorry. We're just going to, before we move to the question and answer, we're going to just to put a quick poll up um, for, uh, for uh, you to fill out for us. It should take you 30 seconds, um, but we can continue while that's happening. Uh, go ahead, Jillian, Tara. No problem. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll just take the first couple of these, these questions. Um, so... Uh, one of the questions was around the uh, reduction in healthcare related costs and whether it was uh, $920, $22 per person per month. And, and yes, that's correct. In particular, in the London um, uh, Safer Supply Group, the, some of the healthcare costs in the months prior to being part of the program were very high on average, with you know a lot of people um, being in eMERGE or admitted to hospital for long periods of time. So those were, you know, it's an it's an average, obviously, across all of the people in the in the um, in the program. But on average, the the monthly costs dropped by nearly a thousand dollars a month per person. Um, There's also a question around the matched cohort, and and you know that it appeared that the two groups don't appear terribly well matched. And actually, we would agree with you. We struggled so much with that because, um, you know, and, and Andre can speak to this, but. There was a real focus early on on a very specific um, population, one that was quite clinically complex with high degrees, of, like we mentioned, of HIV and hepatitis C. Um, that made it actually very hard to find people in London with opioid use disorders who had those diagnoses who had not managed to access the program. And so um, it, it was quite difficult for us to find really comparable matches in that way. We did a sensitivity analysis where we also um, did a, additional matching, which meant that our number of London clients was a little smaller because we couldn't find matches for everyone, but we matched on more factors just to kind of reassure ourselves that if we even matched on, on additional factors, the results would be consistent, and they were. So, um, you know, I think it's a fair point, um, but also is reflective of the fact that this program was really providing services to a group of people at very high needs, at very high risk of overdose, and, and quite clinically complex as well. I just wanted to also just mention very quickly um, around some of the findings around infections. So um, while the rate of infections were generally um, higher among the safer supply clients compared to the matched uh, individuals in general prior to being part of the program. 
once they entered the program, we actually found there was a significant reduction in rates of infections in those who are entering the safer supply program. So, you know, while there were concerns um, that have been raised before around potential increased infections um, in people who were part of these programs, we actually saw the opposite. And we saw, well, prior to being part of the program, those rates were higher. They actually came down after being part of the program. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear because sometimes it's a bit hard to um, you know, think about the comparisons across time. Um, and I think that maybe I'll pass it to you, to you Andrea. I think you were going to take one of the next questions. Hi, so looking at the next question, I'm just opening it here. Um, I think it's around the wraparounds. Wraparound support. So it says, how can you differentiate the effects of administering safe supply to that of wraparound supports? How can you uh, be sure that the provision of primary care wasn't the reason uh, for your findings? So I think Tara mentioned this early in the presentation. Um, the time where this cohort was being cared for at London Inner Community Health Centre um, were only under my care. So we didn't receive um, additional funding for the robust wraparound supports um, until February of 2020. So, so all of the care happened before that. So most folks were seeing me exclusively, uh, maybe a nurse, but certainly, you know, it wasn't, you know, robust outreach support, robust case management and social work at that time. Um, so I think really we can speak to the effects here being almost entirely due to the prescription itself. And sorry, I was just trying to type an answer to another one of the questions in the chat. Um, so um, the other question that I wanted to deal with was the one on the um, the health system's impact. So why did you choose not to evaluate clinical outcomes such as quiet client self-reported satisfaction, um, quality of life, um, transition to OAT, um, which is not a treatment requirement, but it's perhaps a clinical outcome and mortality. Um, so this is a really, really interesting question. We actually did evaluate mortality. Um, so just important to note um, that there was no op opioid related overdose mortality in the safer supply cohort during the period that we looked at. Um, and that um, anytime that you're looking at ICES data and there's a cell size that is less than five people, we actually can't report on that number. Um, and so in terms of overall mortality, we have to say that it was less than five. Um, and you can look and compare it to um, the, um, the outcomes in the unmatched or in the, in the matched cohort who was unexposed to safer supply, um, which in both cases, Cases was slightly higher. Um, we wanted to look and base ourselves based on the data that was available um, in the ICES, so in the OHIP data um, for healthcare usage um, for this particular study. Um, so we actually have quite a few of the outcomes in terms of client self-reported satisfaction, um, their feedback on the program that was available in the program evaluation report. And there's several other qualitative studies that are going to be coming out um, that are currently being written up that are looking at some of these aspects of um, both the London program and safer supply programs across Ontario more generally. So we are going to be seeing some of um, some of that research coming up. In terms of transition to OAT, I think this is one of the really interesting questions that's going to come up. And we have a couple of other um, studies planned where we're hoping to kind of like look across the entire province. Just to get to um, Courtney's um, point where she asked about there was 400 unique patients in safer supply programs. That was actually across Ontario. In London, the true number, like the number of people in the Safer Supply program there was closer to 100, and we attempted to match everybody. Um, and so there, it, we're, I think that we have a much, much larger group across the province. And now that we've done this initial look um, in London, um, we've learned a lot that can actually help us, I think, look at across the whole province, Safer Supply outcomes, and a lot of other interesting outcomes that I think we'll be able to look at um, going forward. This was just very much a first look at some of these like very, very specific specific outcomes that had been raised as potential issues, as potential signals, um, and we wanted to really find some uh, reassurance and some information on the safety and effectiveness of safer supply on these particular outcomes going forward. Um, Tara, I'm not sure if there's anything you wanted to add to that, or if we can try to answer maybe one of the other questions around um, advocacy and how to kind of like move this forward, um, particularly around how to advocate for other interventions, non-medicalized models, decriminalization. Um, Andrea or Ashley, I don't know if you want to jump in on one of those. I can. Um, so I think it's important, even in a medicalized 
safe for supply program, I think you can still find ways to empower people who use drugs. And I think like having different um, ways that they can, that they can, um, oh, whoa, I can't, I just lost all my words. Um, if they could, if there was different opportunities for committee work or advising on the program or kind of like voicing their needs and wants and kind of like having having a role in the way the programs run, I think that's always beneficial. I think if you're advocating along with people who use drugs for other models like compassion clubs and stuff, like don't be don't be um, constricted by the way we're funded. I think it's important to advocate for pe the things that people who use drugs want despite our funding models and despite who we are funded by often. So I think there's ways to still include people who use drugs in meaningful ways um, and also advocating for the things that we want without necessarily hurting your programs or affecting them in negative ways. So I think it's just about being creative and using tools and engaging and collaborating with the community. And if I can just add something to that as well, I think that we're at an important moment right now where we have the emergence of research around safer supply showing positive health outcomes from our study, a lack of any kind of safety signals um, that would cause, you know, some caution to be in place. Um, we didn't find any of those. And we have a lot of qualitative data right now from people who are in these programs saying that they are saving their lives and improving their quality of life. And Ashley, I want to come back really quickly. I wrote it down when you were saying it earlier we gather so much data on people who use drugs and I think that we need to be careful not to fall into the same problem into the same issue that we had with for example supervised injection sites where we literally had hundreds of studies showing very positive outcomes on supervised injection sites and we couldn't open one up because of a lack of political will for over 10 years in Canada I think right now we're dealing with just an absolutely atrocious crisis across the country and we need to be doing this innovation and innovating programs and program models and trying to kind of like do the work of improving them as it's going, new models that are involve non-medicalized forms of safer supply, and the continued research and evaluation that can help us really kind of like improve programs and really give us really good data on outcomes. I think we can do all of those things together at the same time, um, but I, I think that right now we just need to be moving and we need to keep moving. Rebecca, do you want us to keep going on some of these questions? I'm recognizing that we're after five o'clock and so some people might need to leave us. Um, I'm happy to stick around for a couple more minutes and answer a couple more questions if you'd like, um, but also recognizing that some people might have to go. Yeah, why don't we um, call this the end of our, our formal uh, webinar? And then if, if there are a couple of extra questions, there are a few more questions in the chat. Um, I think, um, we won't be able to get to all of them today. Uh, so if people want to stick around for another 10 minutes, you're welcome to do that. Does that sound okay to our panelists? I just want to be respectful of your time as well. Um, and uh, we'll continue to uh, engage with these conversations um, in our other spaces as well. Um, Jillian, there's, or, or uh, everyone, um, I'm actually thinking, Andrea and Ashley, specifically, there's a question here about navigating that tension between um, working as a clinician and doing this harm reduction work and, and this flexible, you know, trying to provide this flexible care. Do you want to address, address that at all, either of you? To sort of a little bit more what you were saying, Ashley. Sorry, where's the question? I can't find it. Um, Oh, it seems to have disappeared. Somebody must have marked it as answered.
it was Court, Courtney's question. Oh, you answered some of it. <laughs> That's great. Oh, um, but some of one of the questions here are, that I was really interested in is like this tension between the medicalized safer supply and doing that in that culturally safe way. What are some of the things that some of the that um, healthcare professionals can do uh, in this current context of uh, a medical model being um, feasible and these pilot projects happening? What are some things that um, healthcare professionals can do on a very practical day-to-day -day basis to make it more um, accessible, friendly, um, safe feeling, uh, all of that um, to make well, those? I mean, I, I, I can speak to, to the London experience. And I think in, in London from the, the very, very beginning of this way back in 2016, um, we really prioritize the voices of people who use drugs. Um, most of the learning that's occurred in the program, uh, most of the developments around dosing or practice or dispensing um, really has come back from, from feedback from the community of people who use drugs, both people on the program and not on the program. And we're continuously doing that, revising and, and course correcting uh, as we have feedback from the community about what's working and not working well. Um, we can always do better uh, in terms of seeking feedback, but we really prioritize that um, both in focus groups and in individual clinical interactions. Thank you. I think I think that might be part of the reason why it was so successful and it is such a good program is because it did take that leadership from people who use drugs and oftentimes we're left out of those conversations and that is to our detriment and to the detriment of our whole society often so yeah I think honestly in my experience as a person on the program it's usually just the simple things it's nothing big it's like my doctor talking to me like I'm an equal and not like they're better than me or like my doctor worrying about like asking me about like all the things not just about my opiate use but like how my teeth are and how like my mental health is and like all those other things I think like those things are important and just the fact that like my doctor has my back so when I need a letter or if I need something or if I need support my doctor's there and I can trust that if I need help I'm going to get it and I think having that ability to trust my healthcare professional is what keeps the relationship successful and I think that is what makes me come in, keep coming back and why I didn't leave the program when it went off you know when my life went chaotic like I just stuck with it and it was worth it in the end so I think just being able to build those natural relationships and being authentic thanks Ashley. I'll just add one final comment there I think I think London gets recognition for being you know um, inventing safer supply and starting safer supply here in, in London, Ontario. Um, but we we didn't invent it. Drug users invented it. And we, we just took their feedback and their expertise and built on that. So I really think it's important to acknowledge that. Can I actually just add one thing too, as somebody who's involved in the evaluation of some of these programs as well, is, is that I think that we have to not be afraid to course correct. I think we really do have to, and this mm -hmm. comes to Kate's question here as well about what the study would look like differently if it was done during COVID-19. I think we do have to acknowledge that the majority of safer supply programs, at least in the Ontario context, received their funding and were forced to scale up during the COVID pandemic, and not just during the COVID pandemic, during the worst parts of the initial COVID pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. And so people were kind of like trying to do safer supply at the same time as they were trying to run COVID testing sites for homeless folks and scale up, you know, um, emergency sheltering options for people who were homeless, experiencing homelessness and diagnosed with COVID and at huge risk from the fentanyl, unregulated fentanyl supply. So I think we do have to have a moment of just kind of like actually recognizing the truly heroic measures that programs across the country took to 
try to actually meet people's needs in the midst of an unprecedented emergency. Um, and I think also that that's an important moment for saying, hey, you know what, the last two and a half years have been hard as all hell. And so now is a good moment to actually stop, take a good breath, figure out what went well and what we can build on and figure out where are the elements that actually we could be doing better. One thing that I'll put a plug in and Andrea and Ashley were both kind of talking a little bit about this is it was very hard to get groups of people together, particularly groups of people who use drugs together during the worst days of the COVID pandemic. And so I would say if you don't have a full fledged advisory group that's coming together, that's providing you with feedback on your program, your operations, that now is the time to kind of like start that up again. Um, as a researcher as well, I have never been in a period of time where people are so willing to talk to me because folks have been so isolated. Um, and so really, I mean, this is a good moment to actually start bringing people together, paying people for their expertise, um, really, really soliciting their feedback on what's working and what's not working and where things should be course correcting, and then putting it in place um, and really kind of like figuring out actively how to make these changes. Um, and so I, I think that, yeah, I, I think that we're at a good moment for this. Um, and so I just wanted to put in a little plug for that. Thank you. There are some questions about how to get pharmacists, how to get healthcare professionals um, more comfortable and more willing to provide safer supply for those who are on the fence. Can you speak to how you're hoping that this this study and other studies that are uh, that you're all involved in and, and others that you may not be involved in um, and how this building of the evidence um, might contribute to supporting people to actually take take the plunge and and do it. Um, any of you want to speak to that? Those general questions that you might see up there panelists. I guess I could start by just saying that, you know, people have been asking for evidence and data for a long time. And I feel like now we can say here is some, and there's no one study that is going to answer every question. And I don't think we should say definitively, the study's done. There we go. We're done. We don't need to do any more research. Obviously, you know, there are different models. There's different rollouts to the um, Kate's point in the Q&A. You know, there, there are different contexts around COVID and pandemic and what may or may not work better rurally or in urban centers. So, there's a lot more that we can learn, um, but I also think that this is our first opportunity to say, you know, using pretty rigorous um, objective healthcare data on contacts looking, you know, five years before people are in the program. So we have a really long period of time where we've been able to watch people see what was their trajectory before I joined this program, in which case it's accelerating,ly worse, if that's a phrase, but it, you know, it was accelerating and getting worse in particular for this population, and then it very, very rapidly improves. I think it really, for many of us at least who are part of this project, was really reassuring and in many ways exciting to see that, you know, what we've heard from qualitative work, what we've seen coming through more descriptive work is, is playing out in this way as well. And so um, hopefully, you know, these kinds of studies can start to have that conversation come out more in the open and have more people be willing to engage in those conversations and consider implementing this. And then, you know, the work of others, you know, in BC and some of the work that we have planned that Jillian mentioned is just going to keep building that evidence and keep giving that information to, to kind of help open those doors and those conversations. And I always tell everybody just to do it just jump off the cliff. That's what we did. Everyone asked, how did you arrange this? How did you get it going? Who did you check with? What policies do you have? The honest answer is none of that. And I think my clinical manager is on this webinar and I'm hoping he doesn't give me grief after, but the honest truth is, is, is people were dying and, and we just took the plunge. So, so please don't focus too much on the stuff that you think you need and, and, and just start doing the clinical work. It's like having kids. <laughs> like you don't know what you're in for until you're in for it. And I think just like Andrea said, just do it because we're waiting for people to take that plunge. Well, and it's so true, right? Like we know what we do know definitively is that people are dying. People are disconnected from care. Uh, people need access to resources. People want to live and they want to be safe. And um, in that context and with 
the tools that we do have available and we are getting more and more information um, about how to go about doing it and what the, what the impact is. We already are hearing all the impact. I mean, all of, I'm sure a lot of people who are attending this meeting know people who are on Safer Supply who have said, this is helping me, uh, who are showing up. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, let's do this. Uh, the other thing I think that's really amazing now um, that's different from when you took the plunge, Andrea, uh, is that there is a community of people who are providing this. And that lets me do a little plug about the community of practice. We have over a thousand members now, uh, almost 1100 members now uh, from across the country. Um, we have a prescriber consultation line um, that for new prescribers um, of Safer Supply, they can reach out and speak to other people. Um, you know, we have our regular meetings, we have re these, what, these webinars. Um, and so there is a community, there are supports, there are guidance documents, there is uh, evidence that's being published to support people to be able to, to offer Safer Supply. And I think I just want to add on to that a little bit. There's different forms of evidence. Um, and so and I think that right now we're in a very, very interesting period because we're moving to the point where there are a number of different kinds of evidence. This is clinical evidence that's based on health systems utilization data. It's very, as Tara mentioned, it's very strong and rigorous research that's showing an impact in people who are receiving safer supply with the group of people who are not receiving it to like as that form a kind of matched cohort. Um, and so we can really say that we're very confident that the impacts that we're seeing are due to safer supply and not due to something larger happening in the community. Um, but I think that it's important to recognize that people who use drugs have been telling us that this would work and they've been asking us to do this. That is a form of evidence that we need to be listening to. The qualitative and the evaluation research where people are telling us that this is saving their lives, that this is helping them tremendously, it's allowing them to reconnect with their families, that is a form of evidence that we need to be listening to. And now we're starting to have some of the health systems, some of the quantitative, some of the statistical evidence to also back this up. So we're really seeing kind of like a convergence of evidence showing number one, no concerning safety signals, no concerning signals in terms of the clinical outcomes, people who are receiving safer supply, which was a concern that had been raised. Um, somebody asked about the colleges. I mean, again, this is some very, very strong evidence to take to colleges of physicians and services to say there is no concerning safety signal for this group of people who have very significant clinical conditions related to their drug use um, and who are doing better on safer supply. Um, so I think that really we can acknowledge where we're at in terms of the evidence. It's not the same place where we were two years ago. We've moved forward quite significantly even in that period. And I do also share a worry that we're going to get stuck in the mud right now, right? Um, we need to keep moving forward. People are dying across the country at increasing rates. We really do need to actually keep innovating and keep moving. And most importantly, move beyond what we currently have, which is small pilot programs in a couple of places across the country. I totally agree, Jillian. I apologize to the audience. I need to hop off to pick up my own child as Ashley was speaking to. <laughs> uh, but thank you everyone for coming and, and I'll touch base later. Thanks. Perfect, Thanks, Andrea. It's great to have you here. I should also apologize too because I was corrected in the comments that I think we were supposed to go till 5.30. Um, so my apologies for saying that earlier that we were ending at five o'clock. Um, so we'll keep on going with our questions for the next little while. That's great. You're being, uh, the others can stay. Um, there's a question also in the chat that I, I maybe, um, if people don't mind me going on a little bit of a philosophical tangent for a second, um, it's about um, the response of providing opioids um, with some physicians being uncomfortable providing opioids for non-clinical purposes, arguing that this is a public health response and not one that belongs in primary care. Um, so I think, first of all, we have to just acknowledge, and Ashley brought this up earlier, the huge amount of stigma and discrimination that exists across the healthcare system towards people who use drugs and the impacts that this has been, this had on people who use drugs in accessing 
any form of care, let alone primary care. We currently don't have an infrastructure for a public health response to the overdose crisis. And so we're pretty much all scaling it up in the areas where we are, which means that I think that whether you're in clinic, when you're, whether you're in, um, in primary care, whether you're in the emergency department, whether you're in an addiction medicine clinic, whether you're in the community and community health centers, this is really an all hands on deck situation where everybody really needs to actually be starting to ensure that there's multiple pathways into care for people and that if people you know want um, or think that methadone is going to work for them great if people want or think that that's not going to work for them then they have access to safer supply we really need to get to a place where no door is the wrong door um, and where people really can access comprehensive care um, there's been a couple studies out recently talking about just how hard it is for people with any history of opioid use disorder or prescription of medications to help treat opioid use disorder the difficult difficulties in them accessing primary care. Um, again, we're not going to be able to change the system overnight, but I think that individual providers can make a difference by actually saying, well, no, I'm going to start to more change my practice to align that way. The other thing that I'll say around the question of we've all been advised to reduce um, opioid prescriptions and opioid use, I think we need to acknowledge that there's different interventions that'll work for different populations. While there might be some strong value for folks who are opioid naive, so haven't taken opioids in the past and have some kind of inter injury, for example, and limiting the amount of opioids they have access to, that's a completely different group and a completely different case than folks who are using fentanyl from the street supply, suffering multiple overdoses, who've had their opioid tolerance blown through the roof by exposure now to years of fentanyl. And so I think that we can acknowledge that for those folks, getting them onto a prescribed pharmaceutical source of, source of opioids is way safer than leaving them in an unregulated market that is highly variable and that is causing the huge amount of overdose deaths that we're seeing now. So I think that we really do have to have nuance in our, discri in our um, discussions around opioid prescribing and really tailor the interventions to the group of people who we're seeing. And for folks who are using the unregulated drug supply, it's it's just so dangerous that they really do need access to a prescribed and pharmaceutical or to a pharmaceutical source, a regulated source. Right now in Canada, the only option we have for that is prescribed sources. Um, and we should really be looking at how to scale up non-prescribed sources, more of buyers clubs and compassion clubs. Um, it's a bit outside of our scope for today, but I think that that's very, very necessary as well. And we should continue moving in the, that direction too. Rebecca, I think that you're still muted. I was just saying thank you. I'm just trying to put something in the chat here for everyone to see um, a couple of papers that um, Tara has uh, shared. Um, yeah, I just wanted to echo. I'll, I'll jump in while you do that, Rebecca. Yeah, I can't, yeah, I can't use the chat, but I'm so um, bad at doing that. You can um, yeah, just to echo kind of what, what Jillian was saying in terms of, I think, the role of healthcare providers and, you know, being physicians and pharmacists that. You know, there's some work, and that's what I was asking to just share more broadly. That just some that just came out earlier this week um, in Ontario, and then some from a little while back, um, looking at the barriers that people experience accessing primary care generally if they have opioid use disorder or are being, you know, receiving methadone or or buprenorphine. And um, you know, I struggle so much with that because it's just so frustrating to me that it seems like it's even okay that that clinicians can choose not to provide care to a subset of our population and, you know, and not others. And it just shows how, you know, baked into, I think, our healthcare system that stigma and discrimination is and how there's so much of a, um, not, and not for everyone, there are some amazing clinicians out there, but there, there's a very large component of the healthcare system that just feels like it should be somebody else's problem and not theirs. And to me, that's just unacceptable. And the more that I speak with people who are having these terrible experiences in the healthcare system and seeing work like this come out that's just showing how entrenched that is within, you know, and, and it's not even hidden most of the time, right? Like it's just, it's just there and it's somehow seen as acceptable by by some. And, and to me, it's just so unacceptable that it, it's a little bit separate from safer supply, but Jillian, you just kind of like, you know, I think that just seeing this recent work and having these conversations, it just it just it's 
so unacceptable that I think there are broader healthcare changes that just need to happen. And safer supply is one way of, of doing that or showing the healthcare providers that are willing to, you know, jump in, as Andrea said, and just do it. And I think, um, unfortunately, it does sometimes take the research to try and convince others to, to come on board. And, and, you know, I kind of understand that for some people that they want to understand like how this should work. And, and some people are, are by definition, maybe more cautious than others. But at this point, I feel like there just has to be this momentum being gained. And we have to start saying that this isn't something that can be a choice anymore, that as evidence is, is building up, that this has to be part of, of practice and care that is provided, whether it be providing people with treatment for substance use disorders, whether it be, you know, providing people and helping people access safer alternatives. Thank you, Tara. Also some questions about that. There's a couple of questions that are looking at sort of the moving forward, right? They, um, and expanding this. So a lot of the projects that have been funded have been in urban areas. Um, or semi-urban or like smaller urban communities or large urban communities. So the issue of how do we get these into rural and remote spaces um, and where, you know, even access to a pharmacy may be impossible, oat is not possible. Uh, and then also the question around the types of um, medications being uh, used in safer supply. So the addition of uh, safer stimulant supply or uh, the use of benzos in safer supply. Um, I was wondering if any of you wanted to sort of comment on those two sort of broad themes about like where safer supply needs to go next uh, in terms of access for different populations and then the medications as well. Yeah, maybe I'll go backwards and take the first little bit of that first and then... Um, so in terms of um, safer supply options for other drugs besides opioids, such as benzos and meth, I'm really glad that this was brought up because I think um, right now when we think about the unregulated fentanyl supply, it's not just full of fentanyl analogs. We've seen very much a preponderance of unregulated benzodiazepines, particularly atezolam, um, in with the fentanyl for a long time now. And um, this leads to very characteristic benzo withdrawal syndromes um, in people. People um, who are trying to cut back their use of the unregulated drug supply, particularly when they start safer supply programs. Um, so I, I think that there's been some interesting discussion in some of the forums about um, doing how to do kind of like benzodiazepine tapers, like put people onto pharmaceutical prescribed benzodiazepines um, for folks who are looking to get off of unregulated fentanyl um, in order to prevent the um, uh, particularly the seizures that can come about from um, benzodiazepine withdrawal. Um, I think this is an area where we do need a lot more research, but right now people are kind of innovating as we go in terms of um, trying to help folks out who are coming off of the unregulated drug supply. Um, both the BC and the Quebec COVID-related um, risk mitigation guidelines do have some guidance around um, benzodiazepine um, safer supply and stimulant safer supply. Um, I think that stimulants is another place where um, the replacement options are not awesome for people. And so there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. I think there's a lot of um, very, very evidence informed um, in um, experimentation that's happening right now where people are trying to figure out what might work for people. Um, but this is an area where we need a lot more innovation um, because um, we're seeing so much crystal meth in particular in community. Um, and I, I think that there really is a strong need for um, kind of like some kind of guidance in that direction. Um, I, I think this kind of comes back a little bit also to the fears of the college that was coming up earlier, um, where people are who are trying stuff out with folks, people are people who are trying stuff out and trying to help their clients and their patients out with some of these issues um, are a little bit hesitant to talk about it openly because they fear getting, you know, some kind of negative attention from their colleges. We really need to talk about how to create an environment in the midst of this devastating crisis that we're in, where people can share and exchange information 
information. I was talking to um, a friend of mine who's an emergency room doctor um, a little while ago, and she was talking about treating monkeypox in the emergency room and how literally they have an ER group chat where they are putting in different stuff that they've tried out, what seems to be working, what seems not to be working, because it's an area of crisis where we're really trying to like, we're basically making the evidence as things go along, um, as people attempt to try to address the crisis. And we need to be able to do that here as well. I think that the whole way that there's been a moral panic around the opioid crisis and opioid overprescribing has really scared people from being able to try out innovative, evidence-informed, well, you know, well-structured interventions to try to see what's going to work to help people out. And we have to stop being so afraid and we have to figure out how to really have a culture and a climate um, where people can try out things that aren't just within this war on drugs prohibitionist mentality um, that seems to have been kind of like the guiding principle so far. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if that actually answered any of the questions or was just a little bit of like my run on sentence about um, how we need to be able to try to support people to do this work better um, and not be so afraid because frankly, I'm afraid of 3000 more people dying next year. Um, that's what scares me. Um, I'm scared of us getting used to 3000 people dying every year is our new normal and not being so outraged about this, that we're willing to do everything possible to try to address it. Um, that's what scares me. I'm mindful of the time. It's 529 um, in Eastern, Eastern time. I recognize it's different times for different people in different parts of Canada. Um, I really want to say big, big thank you to you, Tara, Ashley, Jillian, and um, relatedly to Andrea for being here today and talking about this really important work that you've all been involved in. Uh, and sharing your perspectives and thoughts on on what uh, on the implications and how we can move this uh, this work forward. Um, yes, thank you very very much. I also want to thank everybody who came to this uh, this presentation today. It shows a real commitment to listening, learning uh, and about this topic, this issue, this crisis, and what we can do to move forward. Uh, I'll also just give a quick plug for our November um, research spotlight. We're going to have the team that's been involved in the evaluation of the Ottawa Safer Supply Program with us to share their evaluation findings. So stay tuned so you'll hear about that. If you have any questions or you're looking for our events and things, you can go to our website. Um, I want to give a moment to each of you if you do want to say a last, uh, a last thing before we sign off. Jillian, Tara, Ashley. I'll just say, uh, yeah, thanks for everybody for participating in the discussion. It was it was a great discussion. And um, uh, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to seeing all of the other presentations that will come through, through this community practice and, and the evaluations that are coming, coming forward over time. Great. Again, thank you for thank hosting. Oh, go Ashley. No, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming because it just shows that um, there's actually like people behind us and not just us advocating for ourselves, but there's like other people that are, that care enough to like do the work and change the system and, you know, stand up for what's right. So I appreciate that. And yeah. I think what's great is that the research that's being done is giving people the tools um to do that advocacy so this is really uh the panelists here the audience attendees here you know we're all in this together um and uh pushing this work forward so everyone should give themselves a, a pat on the back for for doing this work and and continuing against a lot of big odds and carrying a lot of grief uh and trauma with us as uh, as we move forward with the work jillian you were gonna say no, I just wanted to say that, um, as I mentioned earlier, there has been just a real like wealth of evidence coming out around safer supply programs. And I think that it's important to keep in mind that there's so much research going on right now that is going to continue. Um, and so I, I think we're really at a moment where we're on the cusp of really knowing a lot about the different program models, the different programs and what's working. Um, and so just to like really, really hang in there because there is already so much more evidence and there's even more coming.
that's a great note to end on. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, I'm loving all the comments in the chat saying thank you to all of you as well. So yeah, amazing and helpful. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for being here.